Welcome to Uninformed Summary, a podcast where four friends discuss a person or topic from history and their effect on history. Today, I'm in the hot seat. Hello. Uh, we're going to be discussing Albert Einstein. Following me in research levels is Matt. Say hi. Hi. Following Matt is Vinny. Hi. And following Vinny is Molly. Hi. Hello. <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> ah! So excited to uh, just hang out with you guys. Absolutely. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we had a bit of a break between episodes, um, as like everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. But we're getting there. Uh, but yeah, today we're going to be discussing Albert Einstein. And uh, yeah, so as I was mentioning to everyone else before the podcast started, I'm super uh, nervous about this episode because there's a lot of information and I'm going to try to condense it into a digestible hour form. Uh, and so with that, I'm hoping uh, that while discussing uh, Albert here, uh, that, uh, you know, we as a society have now decided that Einstein is kind of the, uh, the, the messiah figure of intelligence. Yeah, he's the, like the default genius, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you don't, you don't see a lot of people going like, well, get a look at this fucking Heisenberg, right. you know, uh, <laughs> You know, and I'm sure your kid, <laughs> Einstein your kid may have done that. Ace on that physics test, he's going to grow up to be a real Kepler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, really... huh. <laughs> well, I just mean to say is, is that, yeah, essentially that is kind of the, it's the, the accepted version of who Einstein is. And I'm hoping to, uh, through this podcast, to explain a little bit of, you know, maybe humanize him a little bit. Uh, and talk about, he, you know, he's a man, he's a very flawed man who happened to just look at the world in a little bit of a different way. And I'm Aww. hoping to express that. I was going to go through everyone uh, and just tell me, you know, I'll go to, I'll start with Matt. Like, you know, what do you know about, you know, Einstein in general? Like, what has been your perception of Einstein and what do you feel like you know about what he's contributed to society? Basically, my, my most of my knowledge of Einstein comes from his role in like world war ii and really like the lead up to world war ii because the interesting thing about einstein was he was like really active in talking about like what would eventually be the manhattan project and talking about how the germans like had their equivalent and like if we didn't do this and the germans would get first and that would be really dangerous so he was like really involved in like the politics of the manhattan project but he wasn't super involved as far as i know in the manhattan project itself yeah that's pretty spot on, to be honest with you. And then just like the generic, like there's a lot of Albert Einstein quotes and, you know, E equals MC squared. He invented that shit. And it's important for some reason that I don't really understand. <laughs> 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 All right. How about you, Vinny? I know I've been talking with you a lot about this topic for a while. So, but yeah, we've had a lot of off off air discussion, but I still maintain that. And I had before my fascination with him is his um, his frame of time in which he was born and died right so 1880 like to 1950 give or take that's uh we were saying it earlier trains not even made it across the u.s yet like end to end um by the time he's like growing up and being a little kid and by the time he's dying like we're having ourselves a little space race and his direct contributions to that um, mm -hmm. literally help shoot him up through the public eye into like what matt said einstein equals genius kind of where really if you look at it <clears throat> like he seems to have not performed that well compared to other like super genius academics because they measured mm -hmm. people's test scores and he was like kind of a he was like really specially good at physics and things but some of his other skills were kind of average or like not not necessarily you'd consider genius. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. And how about you, Molly? What you guys have already said and I you, you know the you know the t shirt with Einstein <laughs> sticking out his tongue and like galaxy <laughs> background? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that <laughs> and the e, e equals M C square thing. Right. 
I don't yeah. know shit about Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> Molly did her job this that, week. Come on. Yeah. Let's say it's, it's, it, it fits. It definitely fits the uh, level of research you have to do. So, um, yeah. And, and I think all of those things are, are actually correct. You know, um, a lot of people, it, it seems to be very less focused on, you know, the relativity or the general relativity uh, that he contributed and more about like the results of what that meant. <clears throat> So, so yeah, it happens. It just happens to be a topic that I'm interested in. So, we'll, I'll go ahead and get into it. And I'll, I'll tell you that prior to this, I mean, I was kind of the same way, you know, especially uh, when you know before I'd done a bunch of research on them. Uh, is uh, I was like, okay, E equals mc squared. So that's that's okay. That's a thing. Uh, I guess so. It means matter is energy. Interesting. And then that's about the extent of how much I cared, you know, until much <laughs> later. Uh, you know, and, and actually breaking down like what some of his what, what his general relativity uh, theory, uh, what the results of that was. So uh, getting into it, Albert Einstein was born uh, March 14th, 1879 uh, in Wurt, uh, Wurttemberg, Germany. I'm German. I should you gotta know say these it things. With a v. You got to it's oh. Versenberg. Yeah, you pretty much nailed it other than that. Oh, yeah. OK. Uh, but he was, yeah, he was born to a non-practicing Jewish family. His family was not big on the Jewish like traditions, but, uh, he obviously, uh, you know, exhibited a lot of, you know, the, the visual appearance of, of Jewishness, and this will be kind of a problem for him, uh, throughout his entire life. Um, his dad, uh, Herman was a salesman and an engineer. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, he actually had a lot of engineers in his family, um, but they had one consistent thing, which is they loved to start, uh, businesses that would fail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so when he was a few weeks old, his family moved to Munich, um, which would be the first of many times that Einstein would move. Honestly, dude, like doing this research, I, I lost track of it. I was like, I, I can't, like, I know yeah. at some point he gets to America, I can't go through every one of them, but he moved around a lot. Yeah. Scott, um, uh, if I may butt in, so if you look in his wikipedia which that was about my level of work here you know mm -hmm. scanning wiki he doesn't get to the us till 1940 yeah and he's like a citizen of multiple countries and you know but by the time he's hopped around the world so i understand how you get lost yeah uh yeah so he starts out in you know in germany um and then his family at, at one point moves to uh italy um he also ended up, sp and then after that, they moved to, to Sweden, which is where he's going to spend a big portion of his life. But um, prior to that, you know, uh, he's basically at 12 years old, he's already excelling in math and physics. Um, at, he taught himself at 12 years old algebra uh, and Euclidean geometry over a summer um, and then discovered an original proof of his own of the Pythagorean theorem that hadn't been used before. Uh, all of that basically led to Einstein having this view of the universe, which was that it's all mathematical, that everything can be broken down to some form of mathematics. Uh, and that would accompany, it, accompany him until he dies, you know, uh, is that with math, it's like eventually you can solve something, even if something repeats for a long time. It's, it's essentially everything's kind of black and white in that regard. Um, when uh, he was 15, he his father's uh, company failed to secure rights to supply electric lights or the electric you know current for the lights for the city of Munich, um, which then meant that his business was failing. So they moved to Milan, Italy, and then soon after that, uh, Pavia, Italy. Uh, Einstein, however, stayed in Munich to finish his schooling. Uh, at one point, so they hire Albert like a tutor, and I never it really explained to me why, but I think they were just trying to give him a leg up. And so what his tutor would do is his tutor would give him like a math problem or like a book and try to get him to read it and to uh, solve some problems that are related to it. And that continued um, even at the age of 12 until eventually uh, the tutor couldn't, didn't have anything else for him. He said that now Einstein's, you know, awareness has surpassed his own. So... I may have started this podcast by saying, you know, I still want to humanize the guy and what have you. He was incredibly intelligent, though, when it comes to math and physics. Um, right. But like Vinny said, uh, and we'll find this out over time, is that essentially I don't think that he was the smartest of his generation. It just so happened uh, that, you know, his theory on relativity was an interesting uh, change to the norm. 
Go ahead. What do you think about this like aspect though? Because like I looked up the word genius definition wise, mm-hmm. which is a word. Uh, and the notion of genius, genius according to the Oxford Dictionary, include things like creativity, exceptional mm-hmm. creativity as expressed as intelligence. So what if we looked at the lens of like Einstein doesn't have to get an A in every subject, right? I think that's what mm-hmm. I think that's what the whole point of of his genius is. It's so spiked in one direction with this astrophysical science. Right. And what's yeah. what's really crazy about it is is that even though it's spiked in that one direction, I wouldn't say that he was the smartest guy in his field. But he did something no one else did, could. He thought about how a guy would fall down to his death. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's actually a really interesting way of thinking of it um, that I learned in grad school. is, And I studied history in grad school, but I think it's still applicable. Um, my mentor there said that, like, a lot of times in scientific and, like, just knowledge-based endeavors, like this was in relation to history again, but he said there's lumpers and splitters. And splitters are the ones that, like, go deep on shit. And, like, they make, like, a leap in a particular area, or they, like, become the smartest person in the world about one particular thing and really advance the knowledge there. And that's all well and good, but it's not necessarily applicable. And that's where you get the lumpers that come in. And they're the ones that write the big famous books that everybody reads because they take in the the research that all the splitters have done and they synthesize it into something that either moves stuff forward or, you know, synthesizes everything into a way that everybody can understand it and stuff like that. And I kind of feel like Eisen or Eisenberg, um, Einstein was kind of like that. Like he made a really big, important breakthrough that enabled a lot of other shit. Um, so he was kind of like a splitter that made this huge advance in one area, but uh, he didn't necessarily carry it forward. There were other people that were like better at that. Yes, I would well say said. that's spot on kind of what I'm yeah. uh, trying to get to is like, even though he, he had that capability, but a lot of it is, is based off of uh, the the way his mind worked in terms of mm-hmm. uh, visualizing things. He just took information that was already there and went, oh, I, I kind of just notice something maybe if it's uh what if we just forget everything we know and it's actually like this way instead yeah and the the, the point of what my mentor was saying is that like academia needs both people you mm -hmm. know i guess those those two kinds of minds tend to work different and you need both like you need the geniuses like einstein that can make that breakthrough but then you also need people like maybe like robert oppenheimer or something that is able to synthesize that and you know move it forward that way so like you, you need both kinds of people Right. Um, so, well, at 16, so uh, he moves to uh, Zurich with his family at 16. Um, and essentially, he applies for what's known as the Zurich Polytechnic. And I'll probably call it the Polytechnic a lot uh, throughout this podcast. But uh, essentially, he applies there at 16. Um, they tell him that he's going to take some tests to make certain that he can, you know, to, can do it. And he, of course, passed uh, passed the physics and math portion, no problem. It's flying colors. But all the other subjects, like you were saying earlier, Vinny, not as good. Um, they were passable, but not enough for... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. So, uh, the, the, I know that the principal of that school, or, you know, uh, I believe it was the principal, uh, had suggested maybe he go to this other school for a little while. He went there for a year, came back, applied, got in, no problem. And during this time, so he's staying with this, uh, he was staying with this guy named uh, Jost Wintler, uh, which was a professor. And Jost Wintler had a daughter named Mariah, or Marie. Uh, that's actually Marie. Um, and he starts dating Marie. And this gives us our first little insight into how Einstein handles uh, women. Uh, because, and this may surprise you by the end of this, I would say a lot of people would not call Einstein a feminist. Um, well, these are, part, yeah, these are part of the things that I'm fascinated by, like his perceived genius versus like some of the social uh, lack of awareness he seemed to possess. Yes. Yeah. He was very, he was also very blunt and he had like, he had, sometimes he had all the words in the world. Uh, and at other times it was like, he was just very blunt and uh, that that could cause him some problems. So he's he's writing letters to Marie saying stuff, you know, essentially like, you know, you're the greatest and uh, every day sucks when I can't see you, all these things. And then one day he just decides that he's done with her and he's like, yeah, so we should break up. 
And she's oh, like, oh. oh, and she responds back to him kind of like, like almost like in a very motherly way of like, oh, well, you know, clearly you're not thinking straight and uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we're not breaking up and you'll figure that out. So it's so weird that you've decided to be so cruel, uh, but we'll, we'll get, <laughs> we'll work this out. We'll figure that we'll, we'll get you whipped into shape. And he, like, even she even, you know, he, he sent back, he's like, no, we're done. And then she wrote something back. And I think he just pretty much just quit responding to her. Ghosted her. Ghosted her. And so she starts writing letters to like his mom. Oh, and uh that's and pulled the like, George Costanza. She's like, I'm not acknowledging the breakup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. yeah, so and that's basically what she was trying to do, and it did not work. <clears throat> he just ghosted her forever. Um, and so then he goes on to start going to the Zurich Polytechnic where he meets his uh one soon eventual wife, um Maleva Merrick. I think I previously pronounced it incorrectly to you, uh, Vinny. I believe it's Merrick, but um, Maleva Merrick is in his class at the Polytechnic for physics and, you know, mathematics. And they meet and they start, you know, they start out as friends. And uh, eventually, you know, it's like they have this shared kind of uh, thing of a love for physics. Um, but what ends up happening is, is that... So when Einstein graduated... He graduated one, like, ring above her. He didn't graduate top of his class, um, but he, he did graduate one ring above her, which means that she failed out of the, that year. And I, I didn't do enough uh, research on Maleva to see if she went back or what happened, but uh, essentially uh, everyone in Einstein's family was very confused by why he was interested in Maleva. Uh, as his family said, uh, essentially, um, yeah, she's ugly. Oh, oof. Uh, and like Jeez. would not get him like they they were not having any of it. Um, and they were just really shitty to her. Um, apparently, so and, and you know she had some noticeable. She had a plethora of medical issues. Um, it is believed that she may have also had schizophrenia or some sort of other uh, mental related thing because at one point she was institutionalized. Um, but, but yeah, she's like, she had like a bum leg and there was a bunch of other stuff that was going on where his family is like, I don't, we don't, we don't understand and we don't approve. And he was just like, well, this is what I'm doing. Um, nice. God, I love that though. I stood up for it. Yeah. And so where this is where it's going to start to get kind of weird. One of the problems that he ran into was when he was work when he was at the Polytechnic before he graduated, he was running into a bunch of problems with uh, a guy named Pro uh, Professor Weber. Um And the book that I read and the sources that I read don't give like a really good breakdown of what their issue was, but it seems to be primarily based around the fact that um, Einstein would skip class and he was generally flippant about authority. Uh, which professors I've found are not big fans of those two things kind of converging. Uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> and uh, effectively, they, uh, he was always running into issues with this, pro uh, with, with this guy. So when he graduated, um, and I will say that it is also believed that there's at least some sort of anti-Semitism going on here. Um, with as to See, that, probably that maybe a, the probably portion. at a resting pace. I'm sorry to interrupt, but most of most of where he's going all the time. Yeah, right. I, I think that should be that should probably be out there for mm -hmm. for our understanding, like the lens with which Einstein has to see the world. Yeah, yeah looking like, back at yeah, him, there's was a lot of disapproval naturally. Yeah, and that's because of like World War II. Like everybody's like, oh, well, Germany was the one that really hated the Jews, but like. All of Europe was pretty freaking anti-Semitic all throughout that time. And <clears throat> right. the Germans were the ones that, like, you know, went nuts with it. But everybody was pretty. I mean, right, right when Einstein was time you're talking about, you had, like, the Dreyfus Affair in France and stuff like that, where a guy basically went to prison for life because he was Jewish. Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's horrible everywhere in Europe right now, or at that time. Yeah, and the, part of the reason why he left Munich to go to Zurich was because it was obviously less prevalent in, you know, uh, in, in Sweden, but uh, they were also starting to do like the, con you know, the, the conscription and mandatory, you know, join the military kind of thing from what I was told or what I read in the thing. Um, but 
Yeah, at that point, he's like, well, I am one year before that starts happening. It's time to get out of the country. I am a German Jew. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Bad time. I don't know. Yeah, but that that means, like, when you hold on... Okay, so we were kind of on a thread about how he met, you know, Malay, mm-hmm. right? And it's like, it makes sense. They're, they're in the same line of work. Like, their minds make... Like, she's also one of the few physicists in training, right? Mm-hmm. She's just a brilliant mind. But, so, I don't know, the, the lens that he's got to see the world through, he's probably just looking for like-minded people. It doesn't really... Yeah. Um, he's not, like, social climbing. Does that make sense? That seems to be why his family's mad about Maleva, right? It's like, because mm-hmm. it's not going to help the family. It's not going to help Dad get his, reco- like, recovery from the lost businesses and all this different stuff. And Einstein's kind of just like, well, screw all that. She's smart, right. and that and that's hot to me. Well, well, and that doesn't come without its own uh, negative <sighs> situations, just because, you know, he, he still lives in a society where they have a certain level of conservatism in terms of how you conduct yourself as a person and live in that type of society. So mm-hmm. after he graduates, he has to go find another job. He has to find a job. He applies everywhere to try to become, like, a professor or a lecturer, and nowhere will take him. Um, mostly, uh, because anytime that they, you know, these places would try to get in contact with like the school to say like, well, how was he as a student? Weber is there going, oh no, you don't want him. Terrible. Worst. Never pick him. Um, wow. And it got to the point where his dad at some point wrote a letter trying to get him a job working somewhere and couldn't, uh, could uh, the scientists were not responding it was a whole thing with that so where that this will be relevant to the story is that uh here's i got some gossip for you guys oh, oh, that shit. so while he's with maleva and i believe before they got married um and this was only found out very recently uh you know in in the, in the grand scheme of you know albert's birth and until now uh that uh, Maleva uh, got pregnant. Oh, snap. Oh, yeah, there's that big controversy I read on the wiki, too, about, like, yeah. their daughter. I'm yeah, they're, quotes. Yeah. they were writing each other letters uh, talking about how, you know, um, how they were excited about, you know, getting, you know, having this baby. This was, I guess it would have been in 1902, so it would have been before they got married. Um, but before... Well, he he was like really excited about it, but then he's got a friend that gets him an in at the Swiss patent office, <clears throat> which is where Einstein would end up working m- for a very considerable amount of time. Um, even while he's writing his stuff, he's working at the patent office. But one of the things that they were going to be running into, and this is kind of a working theory, because clearly she was pregnant. No one knows what happened. Um, there is references to signing some papers and being done with it that Einstein had written to her and clearly in reference to the baby. Um, but uh, the, the general consensus, consensus belief is, is that Einstein was not going to be able to get the job at the patent office by having a child out of wedlock, so they gave the child up for adoption. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a thing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely a a, a behavior that is judged here in the future, which was done in the past. Right. So there you got to look at it like that too. Like, mm-hmm. um, the, the controversy seems to be about whether it's like adopted or it died. Uh, Correct. The, kids, the kid may have died of like scarlet fever. Right. So that's, you know, that's deeply affecting. But uh, one thing that w- we could examine is like Einstein's reaction to it. Yeah. And or there's not the much. Idea of, yeah, just like a there. Oh well, whatever. Yes, and that's kind of that's kind of where I'm going with it. like he seemed excited, and then suddenly it's it was very hush hush. Hide the letters, you know. Um, but but yeah, uh, he ends up marrying Maleva in 1903. Um, they have their first son, uh, Hans Albert, uh, and uh, so the he has two sons, Hans Albert and um, Edward. Uh, which is born like six years later. Um, But essentially what ends up happening with Einstein and his wife is, is in 1905, I believe it was 1905, either somewhere around this time, he releases his first 
theory. Yes, yeah, that's special, the 1905. Yeah, uh, the, the special theory of relativity, which basically is, is, I would say, the foundation or the starting point before you get to his general theory of relativity 10 years later. Um, but the big problem that the special theory had versus the general theory of relativity was is the special theory only applied to things moving at a constant speed. No accelerating, <clears throat> nothing like that. Um, but a lot of this started because, you know, he's sitting on a train going into the into work one day and he sees a uh, clock tower and he thinks to himself, you know, he starts doing the uh, what a lot of people would call thought experiments. And the thought experiment that he's going through is, is if I were traveling at the speed of light, what would it look like? What would that thing look like? You know, if I were traveling close to the speed of light and he kind of comes to the conclusion that if he was traveling close to the speed of light, that time would slow down. Uh, and that starts basically what his uh, original theory of relativity is about. Um, we'll get up to all that. Uh, I want to get through the personal life stuff first, though. So him and his wife do that. He releases the, the, the theory of relativity. And, you know, time-wise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be skipping a lot of stuff just to kind of get through my own memory of this, you know, the 36 hours it took to get through this book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, essentially him and uh, marriage start to have or uh, Maleva start to have issues uh, one of the big ones is and, and I, I don't think that this is too crazy is that once Einstein started working at the patent office he's working at the patent office six days a week he's developing his theories of relativity and he's doing it all at the same time that he's working six days a week his wife is having to stay home and work with the children, giving up her dream. And I, I, I would say that there's a potentiality that that could breed some resentment when your significant other is working in the exact field that you wanted to go into, but you are now raising children and not being a part of it. Right. Yeah, they used to collaborate on papers and stuff. They used to, like, when he would teach, like, she would, like, help him with his lectures and lessons and all this stuff. That was, mm -hmm. in the, at least in the wiki. So I want to say that that, that's just got to be super frustrating for someone who's as smart and driven to be one of the few women physicists in training and then to sort of like, oh, well, I ended up in the shadow. This right. Great. And, and there's been like speculative debate on what, what she contributed to his papers and that kind of thing. And ultimately, a lot of scholars are basically saying it's been very, very minimal. A lot of it is kind of just translating um, how Einstein would handle certain, you know, complex things she would be able to put it into words for him um seems but, instrumental <laughs> yeah but obviously you know einstein could see that she's clearly upset and put all this stuff together and you know try to be a better husband to her understanding the adversity that she's now going through seeing you know her dream lived out vicariously I, oh I, oh my my bad i didn't read far enough he didn't do that actually oh uh, they, they <laughs> Uh, they started, uh, it, he started to maybe, you know, shop around a little bit. Oh. Uh, at one point, apparently, I do know that he had, he had written, or he had met this girl on a vacation, and she said, you know, they had like a talk, well, then they didn't talk for a while, and then now he's married to Maleva, and it's years later, well, she sends him a letter, or he sends her a letter, and it starts this correspondence. Well, Einstein put in the letter, you know, like she sent a letter to his house, he sent her the address to his work for future correspondence. Uh, uh, but, yeah. That's you know, not where then, this mail goes, baby. My wife is going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> As, yeah. Right? That's what I mean. That is 100%. And, and Sign, back then, I'm, I mean, I'm that's a pretty the, good scientist, I could say myself. Yeah. That's the equivalent of, uh, you know, an eggplant emoji nowadays. So, you know, <laughs> and so she picked up on it. The lady picked up on it, sent him back uh, a rather risque uh, uh, letter back. And uh, and uh, unfortunately, Maleva got it uh, and was not it was not impressed. Yeah. So, you know, back then, obviously, uh, she Maleva then writes uh, a letter to this woman's husband and explains the whole situation as she knows it to him and then albert's like ah shit 
so he writes a letter to the husband and he basically just says, and this is as far as I know, completely true. He says, listen, you know, my wife is a very jealous woman. Uh, she found a letter. Your wife handled herself, you know, uh, very honorably, um, you know, and I'm sorry that this this happened. Obviously, we've got a lot of things that we need to work out. But, uh, you know, honestly, you, you can understand her jealousy when you understand uh, just, you know, how uh, unattractive she is. Um, it would make a lot of sense. So basically he sent back. He's like, if someone as ugly as her, you could understand her jealousy. Referring to, of course, his wife. His own wife, yes. Very. So his Nobel Prize is not going to be for, like, social progress. No, I wouldn't say <laughs> feminism is not, not written on the tombstone. You know? I was just about to finish that section of the wiki before we started. And now I'm a little <laughs> bummed. Yeah, and he, he just bummed. had... He was very much into, he was just into women, and he, and he, he had a tendency to treat them more like objects than as people. Uh, one of the things that he ended up doing was, is eventually he starts getting in contact with um, uh, his cousin. And uh, he sent the cousin letters. Uh, I do know that I think one of the first letters, because they, they went on vacation and he met up with her. And then uh, he sent the, the cousin a letter saying, listen, I'm so sorry I was trying to get with your sister. So I'm assuming it's also his other, her, his, also his cousin. Uh, sorry about trying to get with your sister. If I'd have known how beautiful you were, I would have never bothered, essentially. And he starts writing these letters to back and forth and it's getting yeah. very obviously headed in, you know, a sexual direction. And then Einstein gets a little bit of cold feet. He sends a letter back going, we cannot continue writing each other because, you know, it'll make this, it'll just make this harder. And, you know, I don't want to do that to my wife and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so they, uh, they didn't stop writing each other. Um, they just kept going. Um, this is way cooler than the science. This right, this, this shit right here. I, that's why I'm focusing on this stuff. Uh, so, yeah, he's, he's actively trying to sleep with his cousin. Um, oh, well, I'm sure that never worked out. Like, they wouldn't, that wouldn't be, that's probably the end of it. Yeah, I mean, don't, you know, do that, and it's no big deal. Um, but, uh, obviously, now, at some point, he's arguing with Maleva. You know, he hasn't done anything with the cousin yet, but um, he's decided oh, that he wants to move back to Munich for a job opportunity that comes up. And it, it's just 100% it coincidental that his cousin lives in Munich. Um, and apparently oh. Albert would talk about his cousin in front of his wife. So his Jesus. wife went a little ape shit and said, you know, basically started a big fight, blah, 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 blah. And then Albert, and I wish I had all this stuff in front of me, but there's just so much. He wrote up a contract for him and his wife to, to, to have. And the contract was things like, and this will just make you like a more Vinny, I'm sure. Uh, things like, uh, you will make dinner every day, and you will bring it to my room, and you will leave it on the table, say no words, and then leave. Oh and I will God. eat it in peace. Jesus. Uh, and like I said, this isn't like, you know, it's approximately what it was saying, but it was very, very clear. Uh, yeah, leave my food at my thing, don't bother me. I want my clothes ironed, you know, washed and ironed, and placed oh. it where they're supposed to be at. And uh, she wasn't like uh, she she uh, surprisingly not a, wasn't a fan. Yeah, like how long until she poisoned him? Well, she uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> you would think, uh, but but no. Um, and basically, the way that their marriage essentially ended was that Einstein was getting pretty confident that this relativity stuff was taken off. And so he said to her, listen, I want a divorce. And she said no. And he's like, but I really want one. And she said no. And then he <laughs> said, but ah, please. And she was like, I don't know if you got the first two letters, but no. And then he sent back, all right, I'll tell you what. If I, when, when I win the Nobel Prize, you know, I get, I get a payout for that. Uh, if, if you will promise to give me a divorce, I'll give you the money. And she said, all right. Wow. Fair. Yeah, everyone's got a price. Maleva. 
And she's also going through a bunch of medical stuff, and now she's having to raise the kids on their own, uh, on her own, because now he's working in a different place than she's working. And uh, then, then where she's living, and he's having to write letters to the, the kids, and essentially, I mean, the whole marriage, all this stuff is just going terribly, because they're dealing with their son, Edward, who has schizophrenia. Um, which Einstein then says, like, in a letter, he's like, yeah, I think he gets it from his mom. Pretty sure. Uh, and he oh, also... Oh, wow. yeah. Uh, the, you know, she got institutionalized for a minute because she was having those issues, and he's trying to have a relationship with Hans Albert, uh, his, his oldest child, and Hans, uh, like, from the age of seven, was having nothing to do with him because Maleva's, you know... Maleva's the one raising them, and it, it, the kids are now against Einstein, you know? And then Einstein would try to, like, make it up to the kids, but every single time, it's like he would fall short, you know, saying, like, oh, I'm going to be here for this thing, and then he wouldn't show up, you know, and he'd be like, I wanted to make it, but I can't, and it's just like, well, typical, you know? Uh, so, so yeah. busy banging my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> so... Oh, I'm sorry. Did that blow up the narrative? Like, <laughs> uh, what a jerk. <laughs> What a re- what a relentless jerk! Well, and I also think I think a lot of this comes down to obviously we don't have a lot of what Maleva is saying. You know, obviously there's two sides to every story, and we don't know that Maleva is not being just as rude back. He's being reactionary, obviously, and we also live in a time now where it's much easier to kind of go, you know, oh well, uh, you know, you said this and I said that, and maybe I said it wrong. Like that wasn't really going on back. You know, it wasn't as open about breaking down these things. It's, you know, it's a very male-dominated environment. So... No, I think you're making a good point. We can't forget the, the sort of parentheses of the times um, for what they were. However, it's just kind of, like, ironic considering the plight of having to flee anti-Semitism, the plight of Einstein himself seeing, like, the discrimination against different people of classism. Mm-hmm. You know, to that extent, to to be blind to the sexism is kind of, it almost seems by choice. You know, it was just. He also right. used to go around the world. He would like later travel around the world, being like writing some pretty racist essays about the Chinese and Japanese and. <laughs> most oh, see, the, I missed uh, that part. Oh yeah, like he did some pretty. He did some book. like oh early twenties. He did some world travel where he had some like less than friendly and pretty xenophobic say about like other Mm -hmm. races you know and it's just kind of it's funny to see the flaws that that round out the person who he is right uh and so i say all this i there's a few things i want to hit on his personal life uh before we get on to some of the sciencey stuff but uh he does end up you know hooking up with the with the cousin uh and they start you know uh well i would say part of his theory of relativity is with his relatives. The relative part. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. All right, so he starts boning the cousin. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> giggity, giggity, giggity. <laughs> but, so this is, I, and I don't have the letter in front of me, um, but this is one of the major points I just wanted to hit before, uh, before the end of this podcast was, so Maleva has a daughter, and I don't remember her name, but she starts dating, or not Maleva, um, Elsa. Elsa is the name of the cousin. So Elsa starts, uh, as Elsa has a daughter, and she starts dating this guy that Einstein knows. But this guy is also known as, um, I don't know what they would call it back then, but nowadays it would be man whore player. I don't know. I don't know what the terms the kids are using. Um, but essentially he was, uh, this, this guy had spent some time abroad (laughs) and essentially, uh, was boasted the fact that he had slept with, uh, two different mother daughter pairs. So what is, what is this another scientist? Is this another, you said he worked with Einstein? No, I, he knew Einstein. I think he knows a little bit about like science. He wasn't a bit major player. It's true um, that nobody finds nobody's sexier than the patent office crew. The people, <laughs> there's something about the beige walls and the smell of stale pipe tobacco. Yeah, right. ain't no party put, like a patent office pad, party. It's the elbow pads on the jacket. It just. <laughs> thank you. Elbow pads. Well, this guy, and uh, like when I say works with, I'm talking more of like I, I know that he knows him. I don't know that he worked at the patent office. I just know that they know each other in some capacity. And one of the things that 
this guy is like telling, you know, the the Elsa's daughter is like, oh, you know, it's like, well, I've slept with mother daughter pairs. You know, Einstein could totally sleep with. Uh, he's like, why is Einstein trying to get married to your mom again? You know, like talking about you know Elsa. Uh, why why is he, why is he trying to marry her when you're like younger and you're you know you're in a but you know childbearing years? Like, is there some reason that he's going for her instead of you? And so apparently, like, she brings it up to Einstein at one point, and uh, we never get to see what Einstein said, but then he, she sends back this letter, and I don't know, was, the scholars don't know if this was entirely fabricated by Elsa's daughter, um, just to see what the other guy would say, but he sends back a letter saying, ba- she sent back a letter to this guy going, uh, yeah, so I brought it up to Einstein, you know, and about it, and he said that he hadn't really thought about it, but that he did find me attractive and that he wanted to do stuff with me. And then we started talking about it and we, uh, you know, we didn't do like a whole lot, you know, but we did, you know, it was enough. And then, uh, so Einstein, you know, and I brought it up to my mom, Elsa, and was just like, Hey, just bring, throwing this out there. Um, and she was like, you know, well, that's up to Einstein, I guess, whichever one you want to pick. And she's like sending back, it was like, I think he's going to go with her, you know, and it's not like I'm attracted to him, but like, you know, he's getting to be pretty, you know, well known for some of the science stuff, you know. Uh so, so that's a thing. I don't know what once again I don't know the 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 truthfulness of what she's saying versus what actually happened, but she's saying that there was a discussion. Sounds like somebody did some heavy petting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like most of it, and they're like, "Well, I'll I'll link up with this guy. He's getting pretty famous, and maybe that's part of like we again we can't forget the parentheses of the time, what these people are living through, like how they see their their place in the world. Mm-hmm. So it seems strange from here, you know. Like I always thought that was weird. Jerry Lee Lewis married his cousin, right? Who's underage, yeah. and then you you hear about these stories, and you're like, "Well, my God, how could somebody do? You know, because if somebody would put it on their their Facebook." Uh, status just got married to my cousin <laughs> you would be like i'm not commenting on that at all <laughs> a like is a damnation if you like that it's not okay if you dislike it you're gonna there's somebody who's gonna be upset can you imagine <laughs> like, right that's all, i guess like it's just it's hard for me to understand how he's such a genius in some ways but in in some other ways it just seems like he's totally inept here right he was yeah he was not great at like understanding people but uh now looking at how much time we have left on the podcast i'm gonna have to speed run a few things so uh i will say yeah he he did the physics yeah he did the physics stuff he ended up marrying elsa i will say that um and then we're gonna come back to that we're gonna come back to some of the stuff happening with elsa later um, but essentially, I will say that one thing that he said to Elsa was uh, at some point, or at least Elsa wrote a letter to someone else after they were married, was saying, like, yeah, like Einstein made it very abundantly clear from the get go, like he's not interested in monogamy. You know, he wants to know other women the way he knows me, but he'll only love me. And, you know, she she was less than thrilled by it, but she also liked him. But one of the differences between Elsa and Maleva is the fact that Elsa was much more of like a matronly woman in terms of like being kind of the stereotypical housewife that Maleva wasn't. Maleva was intelligent and very smart about physics and those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, it, it seemed like Einstein was better situated with Elsa, who, even though he lacked that commonality, uh, seemed to be more of what he was looking for and a wife. Yeah, he just needed that that dinner and that press <laughs> suit on time so he could do the fucking physics. That's all. Thank you. It seemed like Elsa is going to follow this contract, so to speak, more more readily yeah, with like kidding. yeah. And then more like Maleva's just back to like fine, leave. I need to work on my science anyway. You know? Right. And also just as a reference to the earlier conversation, am I I am in no way defending Einstein's actions. I'm just Stay yeah, no. what, what happens. So. I would, we would right. never put that juju on you, buddy. No, no way. of course no not. Way. Right. So, so basically, let's get into the, 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 the relativity problem and some of the stuff that happened around relativity here is that one of the... Basically, Einstein just kept doing thought experiments. And this is where I will say that in terms of him versus his compatriots, he was better. The, mm-hmm. This was the one thing that I feel like he was really good at is that he could visualize math in ways that other people couldn't. And people yeah, would come sure. to him with math problems, and he was like, yeah, but if that were the case, then it would travel at, like, this trajectory, and it would probably hit here, 
and that can't be right, so that's wrong. You know, he would be able to quickly tell that an equation's wrong just by visualizing it in his head. But he was not as great at, like, really coming up with what the correct equation would be, you know? So one of the things, uh, and, and there's arguments on whether or not this is true or not, but one of the, the things is, is that at one point he saw uh, a window washer. And I think, I, regardless, I think it's a very good explanation for uh, some of how his th relativity came about uh, in terms of how we now apply it, or at least how he uh, formulated it, was that uh, the, as the story goes, he's watching a window washer and he thought to himself, if that window washer were to fall down, or fall off the thing, he wouldn't actually be feeling gravity. He's in the air. He's not feeling, you know, outside of wind resistance, he's not feeling gravity. He's just moving through space. If there were no atmosphere, he would just be moving through space. He wouldn't be feeling the tug of gravity. Um, and that led him into the, uh, you know, further analysis of that is, is, okay, well, why is that? It's like, well, he's, he's accelerating towards the Earth at, you know, 9.8 uh, meters per second per second. Um, and if you were maybe, maybe, what if he was on a rocket ship and he's heading up, you know, and, and the rocket ship is accelerating at 9.8 meters per second per second, or at 9.8 meters per second, then would that theoretically mimic the gravity that he's feeling on, that, you, that they would feel on Earth, right? Like, would that be able to do it? And this obviously led into more and more things, but he, what he did that was really good was, is that, one, he revolutionized how we view gravity. Because essentially, what, his, what the general theory of relativity did was, is it said, oh, it's not Newtonian. It's not that things are attracted to each other, you know, which even Newton couldn't figure out why. He couldn't understand, like, why is the apple attracted to the Earth? He's, he's, Einstein put together that gravity itself doesn't actually exist in the way that we think about it. It's actually um, that matter curves space and time. Uh, and, and, and the way that they end up proving this will kind of uh, break this down as well. But essentially, imagine it like this. Light always travels in a straight line, right? It's not, photons are not affected by gravity. It's not that gravity pulls on it. But if instead, if, if, if instead of it being a, like that you feel a pull, what if the matter is bending space? So eventually, essentially what ends up happening is, so he puts out the theory of relativity, no one, the special theory of relativity, no one's biting. No one's, no one gives a shit. You know, he's not even a professor, he's not some sort of science guy. You know, it's like, okay, he went to college or whatever, but this is some guy that works at a patent office. No one gives a shit. No one's looking into it, no one's reading it. But it gets in the hands of a guy named Maxwell Planck. And Maxwell Planck uh, is one of the people that I, at some point we will do an episode on and yeah, I'm also happy that his name's Plonk and not Blank, um, because it's pronounced the way it's fucking spelled. Mel um, Plonk. Yeah, Mel Plonk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, he essentially, uh, Max Plonk finds it and is like, yes, 100%. Max Plonk throughout the rest of, you know, um, Einstein's life is a big supporter of what Einstein's doing. And he actually thinks that what he's saying is right. But... Planck also was going through a hard time in terms of his own equations and some of the stuff that he was, you know, putting out there, which is believed to be correct. And, you know, even now is, yeah, hasn't been disproven. He had a hard time believing his own theories, <laughs> but he had no problem, like, you know, going, uh, being on Einstein's side. On uh, but point being is, is that Max Planck and Einstein start to become really good friends. Uh, and ultimately, when Einstein eventually puts out his 1915 thing, you know, Planck is there to support him in that as well. But, uh, yeah, he, he, what he was doing was not being appreciated when, when he was going through the motions and, and, and figuring new things out. So when he finally releases the 1915 theory of spe uh, general relativity, basically going back to light always travels in a straight line, but maybe it's not light that bends, it's space that bends. It's not that it's curving around a planet because the planet's pulling on it, 
because the planet is pulling on space itself and yeah. essentially, uh, yeah, uh, curving space time. So, meanwhile, light has to take this similar path and it also has to go in this detour created by the space being sucked up by that big old planet. Yes, essentially, that would be a, a, a definitely a way of looking. Hey, Scott. Oh, yeah. Hey, Scott. Hey, that's the only way my little brain can look at it. <laughs> so when you talk like this, right, have you guys ever seen the experiment? I'm serious, where a professor will stretch the blanket over the, the hula hoop, yes. right? And then he puts a heavy ball in the middle of the blanket. Oh, it's pulling the whole blanket down towards the thing. Yep. And he puts another ball, a smaller ball around that. Oh, it's only going towards the bigger ball because it's on a slope where yes. the large ball sucked up all the blanket space. And now it's pulling this other thing. It looks like it's pulling you, but instead it's just going down where the space has been sucked up by the big fat planet. This is how my brain can understand. This thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I, there are issues with that experiment, but for the general consensus, but it, it just helps people fine. understand what you're fucking with because you're talking <laughs> in these terms. And you know, if you're listening yeah. to this right now and you're like me and you've made it through, this part of the science part, good job. But <laughs> I'm having trouble with it. So I keep visualizing what's what you're saying, Scott. It mm -hmm. seems like this relativity theory goes, hey, everyone, do you know how you perceive light moving through space? <laughs> it's not that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's the that's the exciting part of what Einstein's doing, right? Like, correct. He's like, you're not fucking right. Like, you're not right about it. Look, the planet's sucking up the space and the light's going with it. That's all. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, and, this well, is and radical, though. This is, like, violent it, in the scientific community. It hurts. Uh, it, it, I, I won't say that it hurts necessarily, but I, I will say, just for clarification purposes, it, it's not sucking up space. No, of course not. Okay. But it's, okay. it's how you, you... Okay, you said yeah, that I get what uh, you're Maleva, Maleva was good at making Einstein's shit make sense to other people. I, I love I'm you. Not that, I'm not that good, right? But <laughs> I'm just trying to make this make sense to those who don't even want to imagine the curvature of light and moving in a straight line, because that's me. Right. And I, and I get it. Like I said, it's, and I, I'm hoping to, in the visual for version on our YouTube channel, to have a, uh, a visualization of how it bends space uh, that is a little bit more accurate than the general, uh, you know, fabric image that you see in science, you know, it's the squares okay. moving through. They use that like grid where a big ball yeah. is moving through squares and it's like pulling the squares and changing the angles of the lines. And, and that's the only way it makes sense to me, really. Mm -hmm. Because you hear about space and you consider it being infinite. So it's like, well, then why does it have to bend? It's, there's, there's infinite space. Like, why does it have to move? And that's, it's no, so that shit big makes sense and, to me. I was reading a yeah, book to so my hard daughter to and we got to you for universe. And it was like, the universe is all the things that exist, and it's constantly expanding, but there's no center and no edges. And I was like, what the fuck did you just say to my three-year-old daughter book? <laughs> yeah, who do you think it's you are? It's constantly expanding, but there's no edges and no center? It's impossible. What nonsense is that? <laughs> How do I believe it's true. I just, don't, I just can't comprehend it. <laughs> yeah, and it's very hard for us to fully comprehend it. And I've seen some, <laughs> some, some ways, uh, but... Yeah, it's 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 unfathomably large, and and it's expanding, and yeah. But essentially, what he did was he he made it to where this this particular equation it explained a lot of how these large moving bodies in space can bend space around it. And that's where black holes come in: is that if if there is something dense enough, it could theoretically bend space so hard that once you get in it, you can't get out of it. It bends that's the in on itself part right that would be yeah mass yeah yeah so that's the m of the equation correct so and, yeah so uh, and a lot of so with this theory one of the things not one of the things but it had major implications it theorized black holes it uh it also theorized time dilation in terms of the faster you're moving the slower time goes for you it got rid of the idea of simultaneity, meaning that two things that, that there is anything in the universe that happens at the exact same time, or you know, if you're in another part of the universe, is time moving concurrently? I'm saying a lot of things. I don't expect you guys to be like, oh yeah, I, I get that. 
Um, I can't but... write this fast. Hold on. I, I, I feel like I'm I'm smelling what you're stepping. Okay. Yeah, and that simultaneously, you can have two people view the same event and have feel like it's happening in two different times, or one person says it's simultaneous, another person says it's not, and both are correct. So, just to kind of you know shortcut through uh, through a lot of it. It's, yeah, it's a bit confusing, but I'm going to give you guys one way to break it down in terms of how they, we can prove that the general theory of relativity is real. Thank God. And so the way that we would do that is the way that they proved it in, you know, the 1910s, 1920s. So if they were to be able to prove that, spa- that, this, that the, the light that they are receiving is, can be bent around other objects in the universe that we have to find something that you know for sure is behind an object and you know for sure that it's being bent that okay. that the space time that space is curving so einstein realizes that we can prove that the theory of relativity is real because if light from stars that are behind the sun that we know where they are based off of observations that we've already seen if light can if light bends around the sun then we should be able to see that. But the only way to see that is with the sun in between you and that object. Yeah, you have to put something in a way. Okay, so let's imagine, you know the Andromeda galaxy, right? Familiar heard... with it. They were like it's... on a course with our galaxy, you were saying. Right, yes. So it happens to be like the, you know, the closest galaxy in terms of the fact that it's headed towards us. So let's say that you knew that where you're at behind the sun, you know, or slightly behind the sun where you can still see it is in the Andromeda galaxy. As an example. Can, okay, I've closed my eyes and I'm picturing this. Right. Imagine like a kid standing in front of a TV. Okay. Right? You you can't see the TV. Get out of the way, because kid. The, the game is on. Yeah. The kid the kid's standing there. But Stupid if kid. the kid's not there, you have a you have the you the, the image is the same. But could you see something that's behind or should if, if space is curved around mass, then what's behind the, the kid should curve around the kid a little bit. Following you. Okay. So the image mean you could see around. Yes. If it was you, you should yeah. be able to see, you should be able to see part of it or it should move a little bit, right? If it's, if, if, if he, if, if the kid is bending space and time around him, then I should be able to see that there's some sort of weird thing where the light bends. Or that the image should be in a different spot than it would have been if he wasn't there in the first place. He should be affecting it, right. So is yes. that happening? Is that what Einstein's saying? Yeah, that's what he's saying, but there's, it's really hard to prove that, right? So mm. but how could we get it to where we could see something? How could we see the sun bend light? Because if the sun is out, it's so bright. You can't see the light bending around the stuff because it's the sun. That's the main that's image. Yeah, you got to put something between it, right? Right. Well... What if we put the moon between it? What if we looked at the sky, saw what stars were supposed to be up there, and then during a full eclipse, a solar eclipse, we, it should bend the light and it should look different. Not by a lot, but enough for us to prove the theory. So Einstein starts recruiting people. Like he's, he starts, like he's basically trying to get someone to prove this theory for him because it's like no one's really listening to him all that much. He's, he's like getting a few followers. Science team, <laughs> right? And so he finds this guy, um, and I forget his name. It might be Friedrich, um, but regardless, uh, he finds a guy that's willing to do it. Um, and this is, I want to say, uh, it, this, this would have been around the time that um, war was starting to break out for World War One. Uh, I know that Germany and Russia have declared war on each other at this point, and the only place that they can go to test this thing, the next solar eclipse, is happening in Crimea. So they send out an American and this German scientist or you know physicist uh, out to go take photos of the eclipse, so that they can then compare that around what they should see when the eclipse, when the sun's not directly behind it, and see if it has been. The light waves. Well. So they get there, and it's cloudy. Oh, fuck. And <laughs> Einstein, Einstein didn't go to Russia, but before they figured out that it was going to be too cloudy, 
uh, the, the German guy, gets arrested by Russian authorities as a spy Ooh. while they're setting up the stuff. The Russians say that we're taking all of the all of your instruments. We got to take that back. Um, and the Americans like, well, can we can we at least do the readings? And he's like, yeah, sure. So they let the American do the readings, but once again, too cloudy. They 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 weren't able to get it. So they come up with another one. I think it's like 1918 that they're able to go to. It ends up being. Um, there's actually a, uh, a person who wanted Einstein to be correct, but they said that they found that the results were not correct, not what they were looking for. Um, and there was belief by the British people that, uh, and I, this is where it gets all a little convoluted, but there was belief by the British that that wasn't accurate. That, oh, this does not sound like he's starting to prove the case. Yeah, and, and so you have, you have sets of scientists now that are disagreeing. So they go, okay, the next one's in 1922. We're going to go get that one. Seven expeditions go. Uh, the one guy that said that I looked at it and, and I, I can't, it's not true, right? He goes. Uh, the, the German guy that originally was trying to get the first reading, he tried to go. He didn't get it because of clouds, lighting, uh, equipment failure. Um, but the guy that originally said in front of, you know, the scientist, you know, scientific conference said, uh, yeah, we've... Um, after we've taken new readings with better equipment, I can say without a doubt that Einstein's theory is correct. So the same guy that said incorrect is now changed and went, yeah, it's, I can't not. He sends a, you know, he sends a telegram to Einstein, lets Einstein know first. So overnight, Einstein becomes a celebrity. Yeah, he did it. Yeah. And a lot of people were not buying it. <laughs> you know, exactly. when you change an What's that? Congratulations. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so essentially because you, when you start changing the entire way that everyone thinks about the universe, there sometimes um, people, uh, there's some pushback to that. Because prior to that, they felt the, a, a big portion of the scientific community, and even though it was slowly starting to become less and less provable, uh, believed that space was not space. It was an ether. It's like a physical property in which light travels as a wave through. Einstein was able to differentiate that into being that light is both, there's a wave um, particle duality. It's actually what he would call light quanta, but the, it functions as both a wave and, and a particle. So real quick, uh, once again, running out of time, so I'm trying to speed read. Uh, essentially, uh, in terms of what Matt was saying uh, with the Manhattan Project, uh, two scientists around that, this is much later, this is after Einstein has become pretty famous. Um, two s physicists, scientists come to Einstein because they feel like he has some pull when it comes to the scientific community. And one of the things that they've discovered is that they've started to, to realize, hey, uh, we discovered some science stuff about uh, like nuclear fission and that kind of thing. And it could be turned into a bomb. And there's a chance that Germany could use it to turn it into a bomb. So they go to Einstein. They meet Einstein at his house. Einstein's like, he's looking over the math and all that. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, this is pretty serious. So he writes a letter to, uh, I believe, Roosevelt or True, or yeah, I believe it was Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Yep. Um, writes a letter with the other two guys going like, hey, you got to be, we got to be on top of this because things can go to shit real quick. Uh, we, we, the Germans could have this bomb and it could be devastating. Uh, and so the moment that Roosevelt read that letter went, all right, we're working on a bomb. From my understanding, and Matt, maybe you have yeah. a bit more, better understanding of it, but. Um, yeah, and I definitely think in the future we'll do an episode on Oppenheimer and or the Manhattan Project and or the first use of the atomic bomb. So, yeah, but definitely more. But, yeah, Roosevelt was pretty much immediately convinced and they, it, the United States from then on embarked on a crash project to d make an atomic weapon that became the Manhattan Project. And, right. as we all know, eventually did create an atomic weapon. Mm -hmm. At least nothing happened. Yeah. 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 That would have been devastating. But, again, that's a whole other can of worms, and we'll do an episode or two on that, or three. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and with all of that in mind, you know, Einstein was not, it wasn't so much that he didn't have much of, um, like a hand in the Manhattan Project, 
It was that he was actively not allowed. Yeah, because they really by the, away from it. Yeah. I yeah. didn't know that. Um, uh, who was the FBI director for Roosevelt? Was that famous uh, FBI director? Oh was it God. Hoover still? Yeah, I think it was Hoover. Okay. So Hoover was convinced that Einstein had uh, Russian like affiliations, and um, it, 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 there was a, a lot of stuff going on. And what it really boils down to is is that Einstein was Jewish and not controllable. You gotcha. know, um, yeah. Einstein did not like to get involved in politics. He was a pacifist, of course, until the Germans, you know, until uh, the Nazis yeah. came into power. Um, you know, and even then, like his place was raided by the Germans after he'd moved, like they'd taken like a family member, like they raided another family member's place. And he was like, yep, not going back there. Yeah. And he stayed until America and stayed inside of America until he died. Um, yeah, um, sorry, I just I just Googled it now. And yeah, he was denied a security clearance in 1940. So, mm -hmm. yeah, obviously couldn't work on the Manhattan Project without a security clearance. <laughs> Yeah, they were. Yeah, I think that they the Hoover's document on him by the time that someone found it, like much later, was over a thousand pages. You know, Dude, he had thousand page documents on everybody. That guy was nuts. <laughs> That's a whole other episode, too. Like just to just to toss it out there, one of my my favorite author, Ernest Hemingway, one of the reasons he killed himself was because he claimed that the FBI had a huge file on him. And everybody's like, wow, that's paranoid and silly. He was just depressed from all the blows to the head and drinking or whatever. Well, come to find out, 50 years later, FBI had a huge file on him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they wouldn't just do that, though. I mean, and, yeah. and they were doing this to Einstein, too. But he was also mm -hmm. involved. Like, Einstein would probably be bummed out, or Hoover is bummed out by Einstein because he's, like, involved with Zionists and all this other stuff, right. even though it's marginally. Right. You know? There's yeah, uh, that's a whole nother talk about cans of worms. I like right. I know we only have an hour or so, Scott, but you know, there's it's like all these things that Russian nesting dolls of cans of worms right now. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yeah, and gosh. Einstein's in there and all of them kind of like he reminds me of like the uh the Da Vinci's like the famous Da Vinci painting whose name the Mona Lisa, where she's just like smirking at through it all. Like, yeah, I got you know, I got my fingers in this little pie. There's the the big bombs thing there's the light science thing there's the you know he's like a social uh moron but a total genius and he's an icon you know but mm -hmm. if you like I, I couldn't i'm sorry guys but i just couldn't spend the day hanging out with him i feel like Scott, yeah you've alluded to it like i'd i'd end up like getting fed up with him and with quickly mm-hmm well yeah. and you know uh, a, a, an anecdote in terms of that is that so at one point uh, we all know Marie Curie. Uh, she apparently, she, so she uh, ends up winning a Nobel Prize and wins a, in another award. And there was like a gathering of a bunch of scientists to be there for like this event. And one of the things that happened was is that it's it's not funny, but it's it's very Einstein. Is that when uh, Curie's husband died, she started having an affair with her other scientist partner who was married. And so they were trying to not give her like the award or there was definitely some stuff going on where that's concerned about how, you know, she's like wrecking someone like wrecking a marriage, you know, that she's a threat to that guy's marriage. And Einstein sure. was was quoted as saying to another scientist is like, well, she's too ugly to wreck anyone's marriage or be considered a threat. Jesus. Yeah. Uh... Oh, and keep in mind, like he was friends with Marie Curie, you know, like they were friends. You know, this is how he talked about his friends. Because Einstein, because so. Einstein was a fucking looker. I mean, yeah, yeah look at these pictures, right? Honest. I mean, the, right, just yeah. the attention that he paid to his hair, for one. <laughs> Molly, you said you had yeah. that picture of Einstein with his tongue stuck out, kind of like as a mental image. Okay, well, imagine mm -hmm. that coming at you. It's 3 a.m. He's just got, <laughs> he's just got home from a science bender. He's been out with his friends, like, talking astrophysics and smoking horrible acrid pipe tobacco and he sticks his tongue out he's like blah, blah, come here give me a kiss it's like the most <laughs> revolting fucking and then if you don't you're somehow like not living up to your wife contract what a piece of shit i'm gonna bend you over this massive object oh yeah like, like i'm looking at pictures of young einstein's partner i'm looking at pictures of like young einstein and he wasn't much better <laughs> Right. Uh, it's like he's 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 a product of his society too. I think we're talking yeah. about that, but yeah. we're 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 making light of something. 
mm-hmm. you know, right. thank God we right. can make light of it. But right. Yeah. Ultimately I'll say this as much as I respect his scientific achievements, which notably I don't understand fully. Um, it, I still maintain that we could not hang out. Right? Yeah. Well, and so this is where I'm going to do the last little act of this podcast is that so after, you know, relativity obviously becomes famous, everyone wants to know things, and he's having all these conversations with other scientists, and that's when Heisenberg comes. And Heisenberg produces the uncertainty principle, and it's it's one of those things where it's like when you try to break down any sort of theory into like a one sentence description, it doesn't do it justice. But just to state what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle was, is that it is impossible to, at a certain scale, be able to tell both the velocity of an object and its location. You can tell one or the other. And what that essentially did was, it, when you get into the depths of the theory, it made the universe probabilistic. Meaning that things can just happen at that level. And that it's probabilistic that maybe it's over here. Einstein's point of view was, is, well, no, like, even though we don't know, it's definitely one of those spots. And the uncertainty principle and where quantum mechanics really started to take off, even though technically uh, quantum mechanics was started by Einstein, the, uh, or at least he had a, a, a very big factor in it, is that, is the probabilistic nature that the universe is. And Einstein could not believe it. And I find myself in the same kind of bubble, like whether or not we know that something's there. And I just like to believe in the universe that we live in. It's not that, oh, it might be there or, you know, in terms of observations, sure. But either it's there or it's not there. Like that's how Einstein viewed it. And he refused to believe in the where, where his religion will come into play or where they'll say that he's, you know, religious. And he would say that he was religious in terms of that he he would say he's not an atheist because he feels that he felt that there's like a subtlety to the universe that uh to him meant that there had to be something but he didn't know so i would say he was agnostic but where he gets quoted as being like possibly not atheist is when he said i just refuse to believe that god would play dice with the universe um that comes from that and he fought it repeatedly he would have arguments with niels bohr and a bunch of other scientists about whether or not that theory is correct and that's what leads me to his death. And it, it kind of has this bittersweet thing to it, because uh, he died uh, of an aneurysm that he knew about, that he didn't want to get surgery on. You know, uh, the people in his life were trying to get him to get the surgery. And he said, nope, I've lived my life and I'm, you know, I'm done. You know, I don't have anything else uh, to do. But he still was working on a theory that would disprove that, that, that there's got to be some way. And he never, he never figured it out. He died before then. But on his deathbed, they had a nurse in there. And the last words he ever said were in German, and the nurse didn't speak German. And I think it's kind of funny, in a sense. It's unknowable what he said. Mm. We'll never know. Ah. Ah. So, but if you were there, you could probably determine the location. Einstein would probably say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was, when I was doing my deep dive on uh, the uncertainty principle, like it seemed pretty well accepted, except for Einstein. He tried yes. like two or three times to make like hard runs at disproving it. And <laughs> I, I found that pretty interesting. Well, yeah, and, and they were not he, like it. He had so <laughs> few people, like everyone was like, no, this is pretty much how it is. Like they accepted he, uh, Heisenberg's principle so much faster than they accepted the, you know, the general theory of relativity, at least I would say it probably felt like that for Einstein. But what was mm-hmm. really funny about that entire thing, too, is is that one of Einstein's biggest backers is a guy named Schrodinger. You guys probably know Schrodinger. He has a cat. His cat? <laughs> yeah, a cat in a box, and it might be dead or something. Right. Yeah, and yeah. when you get down to like the, 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 the basis of what some of these quantum mechanical theories had proposed, uh, Schrodinger's like writing Einstein's like, oh, this is all bullshit. We all know it. You know, but no, like, I I can't believe anyone thinks that's real. And so he comes up with this thought experiment to just prove how stupid it is. In his mind, he's like, that's so stupid. So you're telling me. And he's like, so he's like, if if it's probabilistic, right, you're saying that if I have a cat and I put it in a thing and there's a 50 percent chance that it's dead and a 50 percent chance that it's alive based off of a quantum fluctuation or quantum thing, then it's neither dead or alive. It's both. Is that what you're telling me? 
<laughs> and they were like, uh, yeah, actually. And then they adopted it. They were like, yeah, Schrodinger gets it 100%. And Schrodinger's like, no. <laughs> so, yeah, he wrote it as a goof, but yeah. became accepted as a genuine article of thought. And I think that's, that's funny. But it's also yeah. kind of, it, 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 maybe we could, you know, I'm coming from a philosophical perspective most of the time. So there is kind of a ph philosophical perspective there. But I don't think that belongs in like evidentiary science. I think Schrod Schrodinger's point, that would be so frustrating, right? To just have your <laughs> argument misunderstood like that. Yeah. I mean, like, like imagine a politician tweeting out something. It's like, so you're just telling me we should do this and this and this. And like the entire other side's like, exactly. Let's print that on T-shirts and we're going to make that a foundation, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. And so, but that is essentially Einstein. Like I said, there's so much more that I, you know, I decided that we needed to kind of skip. And this may actually end up being the longest episode I've done, despite the fact that I thought for a moment it may only come in at uh, a much shorter time. But. But yeah, oh, it's all yeah. relative, really. <laughs> but yeah, we uh, uh, like I said, there's 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 a bunch, and he did deal with you know anti-Semitism and um, uh, most of his life, and constantly having to move out of fear of being murdered. And uh, his wife appointed him a uh, uh, an assistant that he knew he wouldn't sleep with. So there's still more there, and if you get a chance, I do recommend reading uh, uh, reading up on it. So with all of that said. That concludes our episode on Albert Einstein. I almost said Alexander Hamilton, man. I got it. It's been like grooved into the brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah understandable. <laughs> so uh, next week, we're going to be doing something a little bit different um, than what we typically do. And then we also have uh, a, a change of lineup potentially. So uh, we'll do that at the end of next episode. But next episode, there is no one presenter so i'm excited for that it's going to be eight hours long and yeah <laughs> i'm just going to do a hamilton medley and go through all the alexander hamilton stuff so but yeah with that said thank you guys uh so much for watching if you want to follow uh, us on twitter you can follow me at that one loud guy you can follow matt natural 20 you can follow uh vinny at uh well hell did i even come up with one uh Come up with one. Use my actual Twitter at Ted oh. Cruz. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. I didn't know if you were changing it or not. So, and then you can, then you can follow Molly at Mallswald. I've got it, dude. I'm so excited. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you eventually. Don't Bye. forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Mwah. Once I was driving home from vacation in Michigan, of all things, and Google had like routed me on some back roads instead of the interstate for some fucking reason. I don't know if there was a crash or what, but I really had to pee and there is nowhere to pee, but like fields. I was like, I know as soon as I stop and try and pee in a field, some farmer's going to come at me with a shotgun in fucking rural Michigan. So I was like, I got this McDonald's cup right here. How hard can it be? It was pretty hard. Wow. How, yeah, I think. How hard was it? That's the, the, the right? first couple <laughs> rows got wet. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never really use it in this position. Okay, well that's why you don't. Yeah, that yeah, like there's some like severe physical limitations to that. Like there's like Amazing. nowhere to I mean, I don't want to get into gory detail, but like there's just not enough down area to put the the cup without ch real, radically changing the way that you sit on the seat, which interferes <laughs> with your ability to drive effectively. To drive safely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What well, seems to be the uh, uh, problem, officer? I... Well, I wasn't really worried until I smelled the urine all over your entire car. <laughs>